Hey everybody, Mr. Tegmeyer here, and today's topics is statics. No, not static electricity, statics. Let's get started. So what exactly is statics? Well, you can read the definition here, and I'll go ahead and read it too. The study of forces and their effects on a system in a state of rest or uniform motion. Uh, and it's important to distinguish that either case is um, is valid. So at rest means you're, of course, you're not moving, you're not rotating, you're not doing anything, you're just hanging out. Uh, or the box is hanging out, the bridge is hanging out, it's not moving at all. Uniform motion, on the other hand, means it's moving in a straight line with a constant speed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But so why would we want to even study something that's not moving? Uh, well, if you look at a lot of the, the pictures here, you can see some truss structures. Um, here on the uh, rigging, it looks like some sort of concert stage. Um, here we have a bridge. And then here we have, uh, kind of hard to see, but we have some shelving units in some sort of warehouse. Well, how do you know if that shelf is strong enough? How do you know if that bridge is strong enough? Well, it's statics that, that tell us those answers. Well, to put a little more perspective behind it, let's take a look at uh, Newton's laws. And you guys have seen Newton's laws. You've been exposed to Newton's laws through science, whether it's middle school, probably even elementary school, and certainly um, here in high school if you've taken physics. Uh, so Newton's first law of motion basically says that um, anything is at rest uh, or in uniform motion will basically continue in that state unless a net force acts upon it. So in other words, if I have a ball sitting on a table, it's just going to continue to sit there. Um, if I have a ball that's rolling along the floor and there's no friction, it's going to roll forever until I push on it or stop it. It's going to keep doing what it's doing. If we take a look at Newton's second law, this is one that uh, this equation here, F equals MA, that you see is probably one of the most used equations in all of engineering um, and all of physics. Um, it can take a lot of different forms, and a form of it actually is the basis of statics. So if we look at it, force equals mass times acceleration. So think about this situation where you're at a stoplight and you, you accelerate very quickly away from the intersection. Well, what happens is the car moves forward. You feel like you're moving back into the seat. And what's happening is, is that's the force. Uh, the car is actually pushing on you. You, your body wants to stay where it was, but the car is pushing you forward. And the faster you accelerate, the higher this A, then the higher the F. They're directly proportional. Um, so statics is basically where a, that acceleration, equals zero. So statics is the study of forces that equal zero. And you might think, well, wow, that's pretty crazy. Well, why the heck would we want to do that? Well, we would want to do that because if you think about the bridge example, you think about the shelves in the warehouse, are they moving? No, of course they're not. So um, A equals zero, and there's a set of equations that we can use to study that situation. So statics are when the acceleration equals zero. I think we've also established that you can have uniform motion, or it can be at rest. Now, if A is not zero, that's something that's called dynamics. And if you take engineering in college, you will have a semester of statics and a semester of dynamics, and they will be some challenging classes. We'll try to make it easy here. And then finally, Newton's third law is states for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Um, and you can see that um, here in Newton's cradle. And that also is very important in statics, and you're going to see why here in the next few slides. Well, to dig a little bit deeper into statics, we need to, to look at some definitions. And we've already kind of talked a little bit about this. So there's a condition where there's no net external forces. Um, in the previous slide, I drew some of the forces equals zero. That condition is called static equilibrium. 
So you can see the definition here. It's a body that remains at rest, um, or it can be at a constant uh, velocity. And we'll talk about the difference between velocity and speed coming up as well. Uh, but if you have that condition and it's not rotating, then it is said to be in static equilibrium. So there's a little bit of a distinction here between um, a particle and a rigid body. So um, you know what a particle is, uh, and a rigid body is something that's you know, a rubber band, for example, is not a rigid body. When you press on Play-Doh, that's not a rigid body. Um, a car is a rigid body, a table is a rigid body, the bridge is generally considered a rigid body. So pretty much everything that we're going to study is a rigid body. So if we peel back the onion a little bit farther, we talked about static equilibrium, we can break that down even farther. Uh, so here we show um, a couple of bridges. One's unbalanced, it's, it's broken, things are moving, um, it is not in balance. And then the other one on the left, of course, that's, that's working. So translational equilibrium talks about uh, forces uh, that are acting in a straight line. So we express that here through, this is the Greek letter, sigma so forces acting the sum of forces acting in the x direction so acting in this direction all of those when we add all of those up acting on this bridge here they all have to equal zero and forces acting in the y direction on this bridge all have to equal zero when those two conditions are met plus one more, which we'll get to, then it's said to be in translational equilibrium. So again, remember translational means up and down, left or right. Uh, we could also add uh, some of forces in the Z, uh, but we don't need to work in three dimensions. That just complicates things. We're going to stay in two dimensions in this course, uh, which will serve us just fine. So the other part of equilibrium then after translational is rotational. And you're familiar with this because we've talked about simple machines and in uh, the first part of the course. So what you see here is essentially a first class lever. Um, I don't know, we have some boxes over here and we have some sort of ball over here. Um, and the equation that we use to express rotational equilibrium is the sum of the moments have to equal zero. So over here on the left hand side, my ball is going to make the first class lever swing um, counterclockwise and the boxes are going to want to make the uh, teeter-totter or the lever swing the other way. So those two have to be in balance. One important distinction between rotational equilibrium and translational equilibrium. In translational equilibrium, I can be moving. I can be moving in a straight line. Rotational equilibrium, I cannot be rotating. I must, if I'm moving, it must be in a straight line. If it's not in a straight line, then I am accelerating or the body is accelerating and the sum of the forces are not equal to zero. Very, very important point. So let's take a, a, a look at a couple other things here with respect to some principles. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with scalar quantities. Scalar quantity is something that just has a, a number. In engineering, we say magnitude. So it has a magnitude. Um, and here you see some examples of mass, length, volume, temperature, and speed, and so on. Um, probably a great way to think of it. You know, here you see scalar. And, um, and over on the right, you see a temperature scale. Uh, and over here, you see uh, a scale, even though it's not in a straight line, like the thermometer, it's still a, a scale. And uh, this guy's about ready to get picked up by the cops because he's going pretty darn fast. Um, one important distinction to help you in your physics class, speed. Speed is a scalar. So this guy's going about 140, 45 miles an hour. That's his speed. Okay, if we said 140 miles an hour east, that is something different. So to add a little bit more to the mix, uh, we can have something with a number and a direction. Um, those are called vectors, uh, if you've never heard of those before. So it has a, a magnitude and a direction. So another, a magnitude, again, 
is a number. Um, so a position can be a vector. You know, if your mom calls you and says, where are you? Well, I'm two blocks north of home. I'll be there in five minutes. Two blocks north of home is a position. It tells her two blocks is magnitude. North is the direction. Okay, so that is a vector. If you just said you were two blocks away, but without any direction, that's a scalar. Um, so one of the things that's very important, and of course that we're going to talk about, is force. And force is a vector. So let's take a look at that uh, and see what makes it a vector. So let's also back up for just a second and talk about a force. Uh, because, because a force is different than a moment. So when we talk in statics about a force, we're talking about something that's just pushing or pulling. It's acting in a straight line. Remember the equations for uh, translational equilibrium, that's for force. So forces act in a straight line, so they either push or they pull. If a force is twisting, that's actually called a moment. Um, some people call it a torque, but it's not a force. A, a twisting force is a moment. So we can express, you can see the graph down here below, um, force always has a, a magnitude. Here it's 45 pounds, um, and it gives a direction through the angle here that says 21.8 degrees. So that's a very important distinction. If we just said 45 pounds, that's not enough information. Where is that acting? What direction? We have to know that. And just a real quick review on units because you know I am the unit Nazi. Um, in metric system or SI, International System of Units, um, and in science, they use newtons. Um, a lot of times in engineering, we use what we uh, what we think of every day, and we use pounds. But there's a little bit of a distinction. So you see here it says pound force. Well, what is a pound force? Well, it's a pound that's a, a force. There's actually also a pound that's a mass. Um, on Earth, on the surface of Earth, a pound force is equal to a pound mass. And if you are listening to this as part of an ed puzzle, and you are in Mr. Tegmeyer's class, if you write out the relationship between pound force and pound mass, and you use the word slug and the concept, five extra credit points. Has to be done before the next, or has to be handed in at the next class. Um, here you see down below the conversions. So one pound is 4.4 newtons, and you can see the other one. <coughs> Well, once we get through this slide, you might kind of say, duh, because uh, it seems like it's common sense, and hopefully it is. But when we break things down and we look at forces and we look at you know, the x direction, for example, and the y direction, and then the twisting forces, um, forces always act in pairs. And if you stop and think about that for a second, the equation for that here is sum of forces in the x equals zero. It, that has to be true for there to be static equilibrium. Same thing for the vertical, same thing for uh, twisting forces. They must be in pairs. If you have a moment one direction to be in equilibrium, there has to be a moment in the other direction. Um, and so for our problems, when we solve them, we're only going to consider three directions. The X, the Y, and the moment. So that will help simplify things. Well, now if we take a look at forces, there are a couple of different ways we can express it. So in the last slide, we talked about uh, forces in the X and forces in the Y. But what if I have a force that's like this one here in the green and it's at some goofy angle? We don't know what it is. Well, we can take that force and break it up into its components. So if I take this force and I kind of draw a dotted line down here and I draw another one over here, I can break it up into this part and this part. And actually when I add those together, um, when I do um, a little bit of trigonometry, then I end up with this graph here on the right. So I can take this force and break it up into its x part and its 
Y part. So I'll teach you how to do that if you don't know how. Knowing how to do that is critical to your success. And we'll spend some time doing that uh, in a, another lesson. So finally, there's the concept of a resultant force. And a resultant force is, you could have, um, here we show two forces acting in the same direction. It could be 500 forces. A resultant force is really the net force that is uh, exerted on something. So for example, if we look at the blue box, we have five pounds pushing to the right over here, and we have two pounds pulling. So in effect, we have, when we add those together, we have seven pounds. Um, if we have five pounds, let's just look below, five pounds pushing to the right, and two pounds pushing to the left, then what this box really feels is three pounds pushing to the right. So again, it's a key concept. It's one of the things that we're going to take a look at. And that concludes the static uh, statics presentation.